It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, week's edition of Bench Talk 101. Um, it's really nice to hear uh, everybody talking away. We can still hear that we've got that uh, worldwide um, uh, audience a- amongst us, which is, which is really quite good. Um, you know, we started this for COVID. We're still in COVID. We're in our third lockdown. Um, We are hoping that uh, March the 8th, uh, we're going to see a bit of the lockdown ease in in the UK um, and uh, and therefore we can maybe get back to uh, a bit more normality uh, as much as that might be. But, um, you know, we've had several weeks of this now where where we've heard people from from all over the world talking. um, And uh, I think that, uh, you know, that leads us on nicely to uh, to our tonight's um, speaker. Um, where we talk about the, the worldwide family of, of, of who we are and, and what we're doing and sharing the, the knowledge and the skills. So tonight's guest speaker is, is no stranger to this worldwide uh, uh, forum. Uh, he himself was born in the Ukraine, raised in Russia, and then his family moved to Israel when he was 17. He then decided that that wasn't enough and he wanted to go to the States. So in 2002, he went to Brown University. Um, and he was studying economics. And that wasn't enough. When he finished that, he went on to do a postgrad at Harvard um, and then became the assistant professor at the Indiana University in 2004. So that's how he earns his money. But that's how he pays for all of his hobbies that he has to do. So the hobbies are everything from tending to the needs of his bonsai trees, hiking and cycling, playing the guitar, and of course, woodworking. And his woodworking first started off at the age of 15 when he was chip carving, okay? Um, And then went more serious about five years ago when he decided to make a kayak. Um, And he was really relieved when he tested it and it floated, he didn't get wet. So uh, from there, Rusty went on and developed a real passion for making chairs and spoke shades. Um, If Rusty could choose his dream job, it would be chair making. And he's encouraged by a superhero, Curtis Buchanan, who's made over 1,500 chairs already. And I think you can find him on uh, Instagram. And if he made enough money by doing all of that, he would then blow it all in one go on purchasing his dream tool, which would be a panel plane made by Conrad Sauer. So I've had the pleasure of knowing Rusty now since June of last year. And his normal contribution to Bench Talk 101 is anything to go by, we're in for a treat tonight. So please charge your bench beverages, sit back and enjoy Rusty. Rusty. Thank you. This is definitely uh, the most exciting introduction I've ever received. But then I have never given a talk with a glass of wine in my hand uh, or spoken about chair making. So, my goal for today is to talk a little bit about chair making. And, and I noticed talking to other woodworkers that people who don't build chairs find chair making as this um, very exciting but very difficult thing to do. Um, and I will try to convince you that that's not necessarily the case. And in fact, you can start building chairs today. So I have um, a little presentation that I'll do and then at the end, I can show a few tools that I have here with me, um, like this reamer we were talking about earlier, um, and then also answer some questions. So, Jeffrey, can I share the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, good. So I'll talk about two types of chairs that I've learned to build. And so on the, on the left, you have letterbacks, and on the right, you have Windsor chairs. And the main difference is uh, Windsor chairs have a solid seat and all of the components kind of um, anchor into the seat. And then letterbacks usually have an applied seat and the seat is woven later, but the strength does not come from the, from the seat itself. The strength actually, comes from the joinery. Um, and this will be continuing somewhat from the um, talk that was given by Chris Schwartz, who talked about chair making for flat woodworkers. But um, unlike Chris's talk that was saying that you don't need any extra tools, I will try to convince you that 
The best part about chair making is the extra food, not just the chairs that you make. So I'll talk about, to begin with, I'll talk about differences between chair making and casework. So the first one is the use of green wood. You don't have to use green wood for everything, but there's certain advantages to it. Uh, the main advantage is one is that it makes it easier to steam bend the wood. And very often in chair making, you will have um, some kind of um, curving elements to them. Uh, and the other one is that you use moisture content for joinery and for construction. So specifically, uh, most all the tenants will be hyper dried in the kiln. By the kiln, it doesn't have to be. Now I use the kiln, but but previously people could just use placing um, components by the wood stove. Uh, and so after you drive the joint together, the tenants swell and get locked into the mortise. And even if the glue fails after say 30 years, the mortise stays strong together. Uh, because if you think about it, chairs get quite a bit of abuse. There's not a lot of furniture elements that we actually put so much weight and movement into. So it's very important that they stay together. Um, also the chair making, not only we use different tools, we also use different adhesives. Uh, specifically, uh, hide glue is used a lot in chair making. And I'll talk about what's so uh, interesting about using the hide glue, and that's specifically called sizing with hide glue. Interesting enough, uh, Chris Schwartz also has a very nice um, blog post about it. Uh, another difference is uh, different measures, different methods for measuring and marking. Uh, and because you're working often with round parts and almost none of the angles in chairs are right angles. It, it becomes difficult to use the same method. So if you see this last um, bullet point says, angles can be right or angles can be hard. Working with angles that are not right becomes a little bit more difficult. And so there's different methods of uh, getting those uh, angles into the work. So I'll start with letterbacks. Uh, the gentleman on the left is uh, Jeff Lefkowitz. Uh, he's the guy that I took the uh, class with, um, and the chair on the, the most right is the chair that I built in this class. So this is a letter bag designed by Brian Boggs. And in essence, it's very similar to the letter bags that people build in all over the world, uh, including England. So uh, Lawrence Neal builds chairs that are pretty similar to this one. Slight design lines are different, but, but the structure is pretty similar to this. Um, this one has a seat made out of um, hickory bark. Uh, the one on the left I built with the seat that's made out of um, shaker tape, with, which is a cotton uh, tape. The one in the middle I actually didn't build, but I use it to practice weaving. So anytime I'm thinking about using a different material for the seat, say Danish cord or hickory bark, um, I, I test it on the one in the middle. So this is probably the fourth seat this chair had. So the way that the letter bag starts is you start with actually not green wood, at least the way that Jeff teaches, you start with air dried wood. You could start with uh, wood that's been kiln dried, but it's gonna make steam bending much more difficult. And, and it's important because what you're bending, you can see those legs on the right, uh, the, the most left one just been bent, but you can see that the size of them is almost two by two two inch piece of cherry that's gonna go into this uh, steam box and sit there for a couple hours. And then it's gonna go on this um, scary looking form on, on the left side and get steam bent, get steamed and then bent in this form. And then it sits in the form for about an hour, then you transition it into the drying form and put it in the hot closet to kind of set the, the bend. Uh, the way it works in the, in the class, because the class is seven days, that's not enough time for the part to be steam bent and dry. So what you do is you bend legs for the next class and you use the legs that students in the previous class bent and, and they dry by your class. And after that it goes, uh, you start um, shaping it on the shaving horse. So shaving horse, to me, this is the essence of chair making. Uh, and Curtis Buchanan talked about this as well, that sitting in the shaving horse and using a draw knife or a spoke shave is, is this fantastic experience. So this shaving horse is the one that I built uh, based on, again, Brian Boggs design. Um, it's basically a food operated clamp. And so it allows you to quickly rotate the workpiece 
in, in the clamp. Um, on the left, you have, um, I was just build, uh, working on a leg from a green piece of wood. And when you're working with green wood, you're able to take really thick shavings. It's so soft, it allows you to, to shave it very easily. Uh, on the right, it's again, the same back leg from the um, Brian Box's chair. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just sitting in, in, and working or being able to so quickly change positions of, of your workpiece. I find it's just like therapy. Regardless how bad my day was, if I go and spend an hour making shavings on the uh, shaving horse, uh, it definitely makes things much better. Um, another important component of chair making, and this is regardless of the type of chair you make, is the kiln. So the kiln is used to hyper dry tenons. So what the kiln is, this particular kiln is a insulated box with a hundred watt light bulb in it. And that's usually enough to get the temperature up to about 140 degrees, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And you keep components in it and it really drives the moisture from green to bone dry in a couple of days. And what it allows you to do is that once you, uh, your tenons are all hyperdry. So in the top, I don't know if you can see this, um, the, there are legs for a uh, fan back that I'm, that I'm building now. And you can see the tenon goes through the top into the kiln. So just the tenon gets super dry. Now it's important that the rest of the leg is not super dry because I'm gonna put um, stretchers into those legs. And so as those legs are gonna continue drying and the stretchers are gonna start expanding, they're gonna really get locked into it. So much so that uh, some chair makers do not use the glue at all and just use the moisture content or the difference in the moisture content between the mortise and the tenon to, uh, to lock the parts in. Um, we talked about the difference in measure and marking. So this slide kind of shows different methods that Jeff has come up with. Um, and Curtis uses similar for some of the parts as well. To, to be able to drill uh, at particular angles. So the way that Jeff teaches is he only uses parallel uh, mortises. That is you drill it and then there's no adjusting. And so what he uses is on the left, you have this um, jig that allows you to both rotate the leg and uh, incline it so that you get compound angles through this. And then you just drill it on the, on the drill press, get it exactly the right angle, yeah. And I don't know if I've counted them, but, but I think there's about four or five drilling jigs so that you can get all of the angles drilled at exactly the right place. The picture on the right shows you how you align back legs once you have the back slat already in it to find the exact location where you're going to drill the mortise for the seat rung. So th those things are pretty different as well. Um, I don't know if you noticed here, on the bench on the right, you see this uh, device. That's actually a formula uh, warmer. So this is to, for baby bottles to keep them at a certain degree. And, and that is the device that Jeff uses for keeping hide glue at a good temperature. So, so this next slide talks about um, the importance of not just grain orientation, but also sizing with, with hide glue. So sizing with hide glue just talks about how you ensure there's a continuous glue surface with a really tight joint. If you just put one layer of glue and you drive the joint in, all of this glue is going to get sheared off as you drive the joint in. So sizing is applying one layer of glue, high glue specifically, and then wiping it off. And as you do this, you actually drive the glue into the wood fiber. And as it dries, some of this glue is still left in the fiber. Now, the beautiful thing about high glue is that you can reactivate it with moisture. And so when you put the second layer of glue and drive the joint, the second layer, most of it will probably get sheared off, but your, your joint is already saturated with the first layer. And so that gets reactivated. And this way you ensure uh, the continued joint. Uh, Chris Schwartz has a, uh, blog post and he says that there was an uh, outfit that actually did testing and they were telling him that it makes the joint significantly stronger, the, the sizing part. So that, that's, that's a technique that I've never heard about before, but learned in this um, class. 
the grain orientation um, is also important because you want to make sure that the parts move together. It's much more important. It is more important in a, a ladder back than in a, a Windsor chair because you don't have this big structural component of the seat. Uh, ladder backs can be as light as five pounds. There's a company in Italy that builds their production chairs at five pounds, which is mind boggling. When you sit in a five pound chair, and I've, that happened to me once, it, it's unbelievable that this chair can hold up 250, 300 pound person. Uh, and be so light. Um, these are the so the two types of seats that I've worked with um, are the hickory bark and the uh, shaker tape on the left. The hickory bark, um, there's not a lot of people who still harvest it, but it's still available um, commercially. And the beauty of this is that because the seat is tapered, the back is narrower than the front. With hickory bark, you're able to shave the, the bark so that you can have the same number of loops in the front and in the back. You just make it, you're cutting the, the bark, so the strips of bark, so they're narrow in the back. You're not able to do it with shaker tape. And so with shaker tapes, you have to add some filler strips on the side. So I have extra full loops in the front relative to the back. Um, I personally prefer the shaker tape. There's actually a cushion in, in between. It's a little bit softer. It does not make squeaking um, sounds every time you sit down, which can be a little bit embarrassing. But um, historically, a whole bunch of materials have been used. Uh, some people still use ash splint and oak splint. Um, there's um, Danish cord is very popular. Uh, reed and rattan are very, very light and very strong. Um, so next, I'll move on to the Windsor chair. So this is Greg Pennington, a guy I took a class with a year ago, uh, fantastic guy. Uh, I've visited him since. He's probably the main reason I'm making spoke chairs. Uh, I, the first spoke chair I made, I made for him. And he's been extremely encouraging and kind of made me believe that maybe other people want to have the tools I make. So on the left here, you see him splitting a piece of oak that's going to become on the right picture behind him, you see this continuous armchair. And so this piece of uh, oak that he's splitting on the left in the riving break with a, uh, with a fro uh, is going to become this uh, continuous arm. So this is a back and arms in one piece, which is a purely American invention. invention. Um, so riving is just controlled split. So you're just making sure that you're applying pressure in such a way that the split doesn't run to one side. And so you're ensuring that the two parts are pretty clear. But it starts, sorry, this is, uh, before I go there, this is two examples of other types of um, Windsor chairs. So on the left, you have uh, Curtis Buchanan's uh, Democratic chairs. The Curtis designed it, I think almost 30 years ago, but it only became popular last year or two. Um, it's called Democratic chair, not because of the party affiliation, but because it's available to vast amount of people he designed a chair that you can make with the least amount of tools. You actually don't need a spoke shape to build it. You don't need a lathe to build it. You, you can, I think you can build it with like 20 tools, something like that, which I think that defies the purpose of building chairs. This is to accumulate tools. The one on the right is a ginkgo stool that um, I saw a picture from a gentleman in Japan. Uh, and I asked him if, if, if that's okay if I build it. And this was the first stool or chair I built without having the exact plan, so I had to play with it. And I've given it to a friend of mine who's a bonsai professional. I thought it was appropriate um, to, to give a chair with the leaf seat, a uh, stool with the leaf seat to, to a friend. Uh, but it starts with a log. So this is on the left, you have a friend of mine who's helping me. Uh, well, he's splitting the log here and I'm taking pictures, but I did participate. Uh, this is an eight foot long uh, log of red oak that's almost three feet in diameter. We split it with, well, we split more than half of it with two wedges, metal wedges. And then uh, the owner of the mill um, got tired of looking at us and, and just rammed his uh, forklift into the rest of it and just split it that way. You can do that if you have a forklift, but we were just using metal wedges. What the reason to use, again, uh, Greenwood is that it allows you to take those giant shavings on the right. I'm, I'm working on a leg of for democratic chair. And so you can see this, you can take really thick slices with a draw knife and do it with 
quite a degree of control uh, as well. Um, this is um, an example of drilling mortises and then reaming the mortises uh, in another stool seat. So because everything has a splay and a rake, a different way of, of drilling those compound mortises is, is to have a line that gives you the siding angle. So you go to side down that line and then the resulting angle um, is how you uh, ensure that you drill it pretty close. You don't have to, in, in, because you're gonna use a tapered uh, tenon and mortise joint, you don't have to drill it at exactly the right angle because you can adjust it with the reamer later on. So you, you see this um, bevel gauge that tells me what angle, I think this stool is at about 15 degrees. So I'm drilling it with a brace and then I'm adjusting the angle with the reamer. Um, and with the reamer, you know, it's just a six degree wedged scraper. And so you take in a few turns, you check it, you adjust it a little bit, you adjust it a little bit. And so it's a very kind of organic, gradual process. Um, and then of course, the, the best part for me is, is carving the seeds. So you can start with an ant, you can continue with a scorp. On the left here, I'm doing the seat of the democratic chair that you see on the right. And, uh, I'm, and I'm using a travisher done by uh, Alan Williams, which is a beautiful, beautiful tool, it takes wonderful shavings. Um, the, you can see that the, the finished seat with milk paint on it uh, still has two marks. Uh, interesting enough, it's more difficult for me to do a seat with two marks on because anytime you have a little bit of tear out, you have to start over again and clean it all out. I, I can't just sand it off. Um, traditionally in America, uh, the seats are done out of Northern white pine, which is very soft, but also very, very stable. Because it's so soft, milk paint is a perfect um, uh, finish for it because milk paint becomes very strong after it calcifies, which is basically, I believe milk paint is just pigment, uh, limestone and a milk protein. And once it calcifies, it becomes as hard as a rock. I believe they found remnants of milk paint in the pyramids. So it's the Egyptian pyramids, I'm sorry. So it's a very, very old type of paint that's available to people. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I should say a couple of more things. Unlike letterbex, that most of the time it's going to be just one type of lumber. In, in Windsor, you usually will have three types, and it's going to be oak for the spindles because of its tensile strength. Um, if the legs are shaped on the lathe, it's usually um, maple is used for it because maple just has this really, really crisp lines that you can do really nice um, turnings for. And then uh, usually, again, particularly if you're painting this, the chair, it's gonna be white pine for the seat. Um, this is the family photo. I had a um, lady from a store who was uh, asking to see the, the chairs that I built make. So I took them out actually yesterday. So aside from the two letterbacks, everything else I built last year, I built a couple more that, that are not in the picture that I gave away already. Um, so if anything, if I can do it, you can do it. And if you can't take a class in, in during COVID, then um, after I show you, talk to you a little bit about the tools, I'll, I'll give you the two resources that will allow you to do it all from your, from, from your home. So these are the kind of one of the things that I miss when I'm not in the workshop, and those are the tools. So you have the spoke shave, the top two spoke shaves, actually about 100, 150 years old, uh, made out of boxwood. Um, the, the third one is the one that I make now. Uh, and then you have a couple of travishers in the middle. The black one is actually made by James Marcel in England. Fantastic tool, we call it the baked potato travisher. And then a couple of scopes uh, at the bottom. So these are the, the um, spoke shapes that I make. This is a round bottom spoke shapes. Uh, the beauty of those is not only can you get into tight radii, excuse me, but, uh, or radiuses, but also you can adjust the depth of cut by adjusting the position of the spoke shape itself. So depending where the spoke shape touches the work product on the uh, sole and the blade, you can take thinner and thicker uh, shavings. So when I test them, I make sure that I get somewhere between two and six thou on the spoke shape that I make. So the, the three here, the top one is, it's actually ebony. Uh, most of it is sapwood, there's a little bit of hardwood. The middle one is jatoba, or jatoba, uh, which is a Brazilian cherry, ridiculously hard, uh, probably as hard as 
um, boxwood, maybe more. The bottom one, I had a gentleman ask me to make one out of um, walnut, which is pretty soft. And so I added the wear strip from boxwood here. You can kind of see the growth range that's there. Um, last thing I'll say, I think I'm out of time. Uh, those two resources, you, you might want to write them down and they're pretty easy to remember. The top one is Jeff Lefkowitz Maker. He has a blog that will take you step by step through the whole process. And you can build a chair from this. You can buy the plants from him. You can buy the whole manual that's a hundred page manual and it's rusty proof. I, I came home after this and in a year after the class, I built another chair which included buying a lathe, learning to use the lathe, building a shaving horse and so on. Kirsten Buchanan uh, put something like 40 hours of videos on YouTube, taking you through all of the chairs that he makes, completely free. You can buy the uh, plans from him. And if you have a question, you can call him up and he'll answer. Um, so at this point, I think I'm out of time. I'll, I'll say thank you and I'll stop sharing and pass it on to questions. Wow, brilliant, uh, Rusty, that, that was fantastic. Really, really good. You can um, you know, you hear, hear your passion in, in, your, in your chosen subject there. And, and, and also the perseverance of, of making sure that you end up with something really, really good. And, and on that note of uh, perseverance, obviously, as, we, as you were talking, we, uh, we've just found out that the Perseverance rover has touched down on Mars. So uh, very, very valid there, very valid. Do you like what I did? So we can unplug Jim now. Uh, uh, not unplug, sorry, unmute. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, what, one quick one from me, uh, Rusty. Um, did I see your um, shave horses in your kitchen? No, oh, no. So, um, no, I have a kitchen in my workshop. So uh, a friend of mine got divorced a few years ago and he needed a place to live. And we had an unfinished uh, room above the garage. And so we finished it and he lived there for two and a half years. And after he left, it became my workshop. So yeah, in a way I have a full kitchen in my workshop. <laughs> wow, I know that if I uh, tried to put a, a shave horse in, in our kitchen, uh, I think my wife would have something to say about that. <laughs> I, I build the kayak in my, in my uh, office at home where I'm sitting right now. Oh, brilliant. So um, guys, if you wanna ask questions, put your name in the chat on the right hand side. And first up, we've got Sean. Rusty, that was fantastic. I have a hundred questions, but being a tool junkie at heart, I'll, I'll stick with one. Um, I have a Scorp and it is terrible. And now I know why the guy sold it to me so cheap. Um, uh, I was wondering, you had two there at the bottom. What would you recommend in terms of manufacturers models? So I use this one and that's um, Ray Isles. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, perfect. Uh, it's pretty affordable. Uh, for you, the shipping is not going to be an issue. Yeah, I've, I've um, seen, seen that one out there. I just didn't know if it was any good or not. That's actually a, a really I love one. it. Yeah, some people complain about the angle of the handles, but you can bend it in the vise if, if you feel I, like I'm you're eating. Yeah, I'm looking at the angle of the bevel and I can already tell it's a hell of a lot better than what I've got. So I'll put that on my shopping list. <laughs> okay, so I don't know who made your, your score, but it could be that usually they don't harden this part. So you should be able to adjust it. I think and it's, also, um, I think it might be one of the two cherries ones. It's a, uh, it's, okay. you know, it's 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 a total rerun. It's it's less effort for me to buy one than it is for me to do the amount of work this thing would need yeah, to go yeah. to send. Sharpening a scorp is not easy, but Curtis has a video on that as well. Cool. All right, thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, sure Cheers, Rusty. Thank you for a brilliant talk. As I expected, you would you come out with um cheers i think we could all raise a drink to to um to rusty on that i think i'm gonna start drinking in all my presentations from now on <laughs> uh, josh in case you invite me to give a talk there so um rusty you you've made a few chairs and stools in your in your time something um i was speaking to scott earlier about was um around how you work out how to taper the legs on what angle you should taper the legs on a chair or a stool or whatever you're making how do you make that angle is it all aesthetics or do you actually use any rules so i don't design chairs but i've designed a couple of stools and i can tell you that trial and error goes a long way 
So the, the stool that, remember that ginkgo stool, the one with the red seat? Yeah. Um, so that was, I believe, 10 degrees and it wasn't enough. And so I probably would do uh, 15 degrees for a three-legged stool. Um, it very much depends. So if you're building a stool, say, for a counter, then the angles are going to be completely different because you cannot have a seat that's parallel. It's going to start cutting into your thighs. So you have to drop the seat and you have to adjust the angles as well. Um, I would say the easiest is to buy a set of plans and, and just see what plans people use. So I've heard Brian Boggs ask that question. Brian Boggs have, have built a lot of chairs. He's a very famous chair maker in the States. Um, and he says that all those angles have been worked out. So don't, don't try to um, build something new, or at least start from something that's already there. Okay, and then from, from the angles that, have you noticed any difference in the angles from, from height? If you, if you modify a design just for height, would you change the Yeah, angle? so that, that's exactly what I was talking about. So, so for three-legged stool, that's a table height. Yeah. Yeah, so 18 inches. Um, <clears throat> the siding angles for the back legs is at the front leg. And for the front leg, it's in the middle between the back leg. Right? So when I'm aligning it, right, yeah. that's the yeah. siding angle. And then it's 15 degrees. Now, if I'm going to increase this to, say, 24 um, inches so for a uh, counter height, I have to drop the seat. Once I drop the seat, if the angle is the same, the legs are gonna be way out from the seat and you're gonna start tripping on them. So I have to adjust the angles as well. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But all this stuff has, has been developed already. So I think it would be, I would recommend that you start there. I don't remember exactly. I think the back seats um, on Curtis's chairs, maybe 22 degrees. And the, I don't remember. Um, but that's, by the way, if you're looking for a piece of art to put on your wall, buy those uh, plants for the chair. I think those are beautiful as an art itself, aside from the information. Actually, Jeff Lefkowitz is the one who draws the plans now for, for Curtis. Curtis stands on the chair and Jeff does the plans and the chair is the payment for the plan. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you very much. Sure. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Mitch, over to you. Hi, Rusty. That was uh, fabulous. It's lovely to, to hear your enthusiasm and to see the chairs you've been making. Um, really, just a comment, just a comment, really, on, on how, how great it is and to see those. Uh, and um, to thank you for offering to do a, a tip talk with me uh, later on. So uh, everyone can see some more information in a tip talk video coming up soon. Thanks, Rusty. Appreciate the promotion. Thank you. <laughs> That's his way of making you do it. <laughs> it's a bit like my bullying in the old days, isn't it? Uh, anyway, Chester, over to you. Yeah, um, I luckily got back on. I had to reboot. Everything Look at this. Fine. Uh, but apparently my computer over the last couple of weeks decided it was done with all that. So um, nice talk. Um, a, a lot of great information. I, I think that you probably could have gone on for another hour and none of us would have complained, Rusty. Um, I, I, when you came to visit, I don't know if you know it, uh, but uh, Brian uh, Boggs lives here in Asheville. And yep. if, if I'd known you better at the time, I would have taken you over there because um, he's, he's very, um, very open to, to meeting other chair makers. Um, so my question for you, is uh, on the Windsor chair with the continuous rail, um, the classic Windsor. Um, are you uh, two questions? Are you pre-drilling them before you bend them, or are you bending them completely, wrapping them, putting them into the jig before you drill them? If you're doing it before you drill them, how are you getting? Do you have a jig for each one of those angles that you're and holes that you have to put in? Because there's quite a few on that one. Yeah, there are. So I can I, I know of two ways. I can tell you the one way that that um, Greg teaches that probably the scariest thing I've ever done chair making. And 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 there's another way where you just line everything up, line all those spindles. So you bend first. Yeah, you you, you don't want to drill first because a, you don't know the angles, and B, 
it can split there. So you bend first and then uh, you drill the posts for the arms and then you put it in place on two arms and you actually, there's a trick that you do. You take one of the spindles and you turn it upside down and support it in the middle. And so this way you can line it up. Now you can put all of your spindles in and line them up and just that creates the guide and you drill in parallel to it. Okay. Now, the way that Greg teaches, um, I'm gonna try to show you this. It, it, give me one second. Um, okay, there it is. So this is this is a uh, hoop back rocker uh, or balloon back rocker. It was very rare. Uh, Greg built one and he gave me because I was asking for a rocker to play guitar in. But basically, you line it up with a drill. And then you can't see. So you line it up and then you tilt your, your head back and then you lift the, the drill and you drill it blind, hoping mm -hmm. you're gonna hit it. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's another way. I don't think I, I, I have the, the courage to do it myself like that ever again. I just line up the spindles. I use a rubber band to hold it in place and I just drill in parallel to that spindle. I've repaired chairs um, like that that split right there at the at the holes um, often, but um, yeah. but the, some of them are not drilled through. Some are, are are hidden, and they're drilled from underneath. And I imagine those have to be machined in a on a big rig that the the drills are all. Or no no no. Or, so, so it's the same thing on a continuous arm. The two sh the two shortest of the long spindles are blind. Ah. Because they come at such an angle, but once you've aligned all of the other ones, you just line it up and drill it from the bottom. So finally, just you said in one of your classes that you received the bent uh, uh, supports from the bent class plates, before. Yeah. In yep. the case of the of the um, of the continuous arm, was the one that you built was that also by a previous student and then no 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 we did that no we did everything from splitting it from the um writhing it writhing. to shaping it to bending but it's so much thinner the continuous arm is like a quarter inch thick so it's three quarters inch thick so it and, and it's and it's oak that drives red oak that drives much faster it's open grain but on your bend, it's communal, isn't it? Usually it takes more than one person to be able to do those because you have to pull them both down and, and double No, curve. you can do it by yourself. Oh, you, you can, can do it by you, Yeah, yeah, you put, a, you put a wedge in the middle and then you do one side and then the other side. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you, Rusty. I don't want to sure. take up uh, other people's time, but great, great, great work. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Lovely, uh, it's Paul, over to you, Paul. Fantastic talk, Rusty, thank you very much. Hey Paul, thank you. I, I love the uh, the shave horse. Can you actually will will that actually uh, take apart? So you can just put it away, or is it is it a sort of like a fixed system? The one I have does not come apart. Uh, it has bolts in it, so I could take it apart, but um, I don't. Act, um, I don't know anyone who takes them apart. Yeah. So Greg has, I think, seven in his workshop. Uh, seven. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he teaches classes, and oh, so he doesn't have seven for personal use. Oh, today no, I'll no, use. No, no, no. It's Monday. I'll use the Monday shave horse. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it could be. It could be that too. He might be choosing the favorite for the day. I don't know. Um, so they could theoretically come apart, but I don't know yeah. people who do that. It looks like the seat you can just literally pick it up and move it is that right it, it, that's exactly true yeah and, and so you end up doing this a lot so um i don't know if you look i have a little blog post about how i make spoke shapes sometimes i i cut it on the other side of the jog uh-huh so i can move the seat really far forward or far back depending on how long the piece is so yeah, you can that, lean over and push rather than pull yeah <clears throat> yeah i didn't know I did stalk all your uh, spoke shave things, yeah. Fantastic work. Uh, it, thank you. Great presentation. Absolutely. It just wasn't long enough. You could eat. Chester's right. You could have gone for another half an hour. 
I, I could probably go for much longer, but I don't know that you can. So I, I was given directions of 30 minutes and, and I tried to so if we could. Well, we're the 5 a.m. crew. <laughs> Me and Shreddy can go on. Thanks very we much. We know where to go. Maybe we can have part two later on then, can't we? Uh, Matthias, over to you. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, Rusty, thank you very, very much. It was a fascinating talk. Uh, uh, My pleasure. And, and uh, lots of lots of insights. Uh, chairs are on my list of things I will want to tackle one day, but I, they're they're a bit further down the list than, than other stuff. What I wanted to ask you though was, uh, have you considered or are you planning to also go in move into joint chairs, some traditional joinery chairs where 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 you have basically a, a, a mortise and tenon connection between the legs and so I think you're talking about maybe chairs kind of like arts and crafts yeah art and crafts or, or I mean yeah the style doesn't matter but but the way a chip and egg chair was constructed well so if you think about it the chairs I talked about they all constructed with mortise and tenon those are just brown mortise and tenon yeah of course of course but I, I, I mean okay so let's say square mortise and tenon not necessarily uh, but two, two, well, so I, I would like to build a um, Maloof type rocker at some point. Yeah. Uh, Maloof type rocker is not particularly challenging in terms of joinery. Yeah. Uh, it's put together with screws. Yeah. But the, the thing that the more I learn about chair making, the more I start appreciating this juxtaposition between strength and lightness. Yeah. And, and, and the, the square chairs, uh, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. They don't have that other part, yeah. No, no, um, no. I know what you mean. And so, uh, sorry. With that said, I do. So, a friend of mine and I built a uh, milled a log of oak a couple of years ago. Yeah. So now it's getting nice and dry. And my friend has a mission style recliner, uh, an armchair. Yeah. Um, made by uh what's the company the classic company that does arts and crafts in the u.s uh, gustav stickley yeah and, and so we probably will be making a copy of it but if it was for me i wouldn't be making it yeah yeah, yeah. Um, there's going to be use of table saw probably and, and yeah. things like that um, yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah no that my heart is just not in it but no, I, uh, I, I i see what you mean i mean the not that particular model of chair, not, certainly not right. the, the, the fancy uh, rock coasters, that doesn't interest me, but I am attracted to, to some of the more, more, shall we say, mid-century modern types yeah. of, of joint chairs. That, that's yeah. something I, I feel really attracted to, but, uh, but also some of, the, and of course, being Swedish, stick chairs are, are a big part of our, our heritage. We and, also, and Wagner's chairs have, have yeah. particular beautiful lines uh, yeah. that I think he was achieving without much steam bending at all. The, that yeah. chair, I think, doesn't have any steam bending, and he's achieving those beautiful lines with yeah. the finger joint. Yeah. Um, you know, never say never. Uh, I haven't thought about it. No, no. But I will show you what, one more thing. Yep. This is something that you probably cannot do with the other chair. No. That's... And that's the beauty of having red or white oak at 516 that has the tensile strength and this elegance of really thin pieces that are so strong. Yeah. 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 The, the, there's a joke. We, we also call our stick chairs democratic chairs. Uh, not because, not because, of, because, of, because they are equally uncomfortable to everyone, whether you're, <laughs> whether you're the king or the peasant. <laughs> Your bum will hurt after uh, after twenty minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rusty. Absolutely. How funny! How funny! Um, Eric, over to you. Hi. Well, thanks, Rusty. That was a, fa a fascinating talk. It's always good to get the insights into how other people do things. As, as a, a quick aside, I think I, I want to say this was Chris Schwartz, but I'm not sure. But to get the, the angles right for a new project, he had some polystyrene and uh, wire coat hangers and did something in the, the right proportions, but you could bend the wires and you could walk around and look at it for a few days uh, and then, uh, you know, change the angles. And then once you got angles that you like, you'd measure them and that's what you do. 
Um, but my, my, my question is, uh, uh, it's probably it's a definition question, but the, uh, the, the Windsor chairs always have the, the hardwood card seat. Is there, uh, is, is there a Windsor chair that, chair that you could do that would have, well, I think you could do it, but is there a Windsor chair that would have woven seating or would that not make it a Windsor chair? So I'm, I'm not sure, it could be a definition thing, don't know. I, I guess you could put a foster um, seed on top of the uh, wooden seed. Um, my understanding, and, and I'm not at all an expert in this. I, I have not read many books on this. I'm a college professor. I don't like to read. Um, but you could put a, a cushion or an upholstered seat on top. But my understanding is that you do need to have the strength uh, of the wooden seat to hold all of the components together. Okay, uh, that's, that's interesting to know. It's, it's also, I forgot to mention, I, I'm, an, I'm an economist as well, so it's nice to see another economist. That's that's funny. <laughs> yeah, there's another one coming up in a, in a few minutes. All right. Well, there's lots of us about. <laughs> and they still let us in. I don't know why. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Absolutely. You're all very humorous, that's why. So uh, we, 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 we like to hear it. We like to hear it. Uh, Andy, Tuckwell, over to you. Yeah. Hi, Rusty. Um, hey, thanks, Andy. For the, thanks for the presentation. And your enthusiasm for your new chair making enterprise comes over so clearly and strongly. I'm sure you'll be convincing lots of people to have a go. Um, Thank you. Question uh, as you make more chairs and more different chairs do you find yourself not wanting to use a jig because you wouldn't want to have to make a new set of jigs for every new experiment slight variation you, are you being pulled into a, a freer way of doing it um you know maybe that's the reason i only made two letterbacks because there's a jig for every angle um mm. and, and the next one I'm gonna build, I, I wanna build them differently. I think the more I understand how to measure angles, how to um, mark them and drill them, I will be relying on it le less and less. So actually, it, it's funny. I just saw the way that Neil, uh, Lawrence Neal uh, drills mortises for slats in, the, in his back legs, which he basically just puts a drill in the chuck of, um, of a lathe and, and oh. hold, holds the back leg and just pushes it in. Right. There's no jigs. Yeah. Just, yeah, but I don't know. He's built hundreds and hundreds of chairs. Uh, and apparently now he has apprentices. So the art is going to continue for Jimson to him to, to the apprentices. So I, I'm, yes, absolutely. I'd like to rely less and less on those. Uh, but. That's probably true for uh, sharpening the plane irons too. Yeah. Uh, at some point, I'll be yeah. comfortable enough not to use the, the, the honing guide for that too. But yeah, no, jigs do make it, um, a, 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 there's a little bit less freedom there. Um, yeah. But it means your first, first chair can be a success and encouraging, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> even with that, you know, even though you have all the jigs and all the information, there is still a little bit of, uh, for example, you know, you bend the slats and if the wrong angle, then the, the legs are not gonna come together for the uh, back uh, rung. Mm. And so you end up using a heat gun to unbend some of it <laughs> to make yeah. sure it comes together, you know, so, mm. yeah. Right, and while I'm on, if I can just offer a comment to anyone thinking of getting a shave horse, and um, the first time I ever encountered one, it was a friend of a friend that I'd met in the pub. And he said, well, come back and have a look at this shave horse. And he was living in a bedsit, just a one rented room in a shared house. And he'd got, instead of having any other furniture, he got his bed, he got the shave horse. And I sat on it and had a go. And you could immediately see what a beautifully efficient machine it was because the harder you pull, the stronger it grips. And yep. you can immediately take the piece out and move it around. There's no delay. You're not undoing a th screw thread. You're not 
resetting stuff that's fussy and finicky. It's just part of your body almost. Brilliant. It's a, Curtis Buchanan says that the shaving horse and, and the uh, drawn up go together like peanut butter and jelly. And, <laughs> and it, the, yeah. I don't like to use, I don't have as much control with the um, drawn up as Curtis does, of course, which is why I like those really fine uh, spoke shapes. But for me, a shaving horse and a spoke shape is a fantastic combination. Mm. Yeah. So, and, and everyone's got enough room for one. There's no excuse. They're definitely true. Yeah. If Thank you, you don't, just sell your table saw. <laughs> Lovely. Um, Josh, over to you. Yeah. Hey, Rusty. Josh, are you an economist? Y yeah, that's what I hear. Uh, 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 yeah, I am. And I, I refrain from trying to ask the first question even, which is, you know, usually the economist wants to butt in, you know, you get to the first slide and uh, the title slide. Yeah. Yeah. The that's title slide. I just derail the whole, whole talk because uh, that's the custom. Uh, yeah. So I have two questions and I'll ask the boring one first. Uh, it's about glue sizing. So I'm familiar with it when you're using like it, when you have ingrain and you, you know, you size the ingrain so that the, the next glue you put on doesn't suck in, but it sounds like you're using it for a completely different purpose. And are, are you sizing the, the tenon or or the mortise or which are you, because I, I, with the ingrain, I would think you, you would size the uh, inside the mortise, but it sounds like you're sizing the tenons. And so. I size both. Okay. So, so the, the idea is that you put glue in and you don't have to put a very thin layer because you're going to wipe it off. As you wipe it off, you rub it into, this, into the okay. wood fiber. Yeah. And, and actually in the mortise, you have some end grain. In the yeah. tenon, you're probably right. not going to have as much. You're just going to have it at the end, but there it's not holding. Yeah. But yeah, but you wipe it off and you just let it sit for a few minutes and it dries pretty fast because you already rubbed it into a really yeah. thin, thin layer. Yeah. Okay. The more fun question is, is about tools. Uh, so you, you like the round bottom spoke shaves and it's, from the way you talk about it, it sounds like you're using them even, even when you're not cutting a, a curve. Uh, is that because of the controllability or I guess, sell me on a round bottom spoke shave because I, you know, I don't have any. Um. Well, I, I happen to know a person who makes them uh, to order, <laughs> actually, but but other side. Um, so the beauty of the flat bottom spoke shave is that it gives you a lot of control, right? It gives you repeatable shavings of the same thickness. And, and I love box spoke shaves. If you notice, I have all three and I use them a lot. Um, what I like about the round bottom is A, I can get to a really thin shaving and then I can triple it without the thickness of the shaving without hitting the iron at all or, or advancing the iron. Yeah. So it's going from this to this. And if you didn't see the difference, then there's probably no difference. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes it's easier for people to do on a push. So uh, Peter Galbert says that with round bottom spoke shades, he only uses them on the push because it gives you so much more control in the angle of your wrists. Um, so it's almost like the angle of a, with, with a draw knife or something you're, could you have, you, you can yeah. go really deep or fine. Does not have, so I, I wish I had a diagram. So you have the the um, the sole and you have the angle of, of um, the blade, right? Okay. And it's going to hit in two places. It's going to hit the tip of the blade and some point on the sole. Depending on where it is, you're going to get a thicker and a thinner shaving. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it's I, counterintuitive because if you lay it back more, it's going to be a thicker shaving. And if you okay. extend it up more, it's going to be a thinner shaving. Yeah. So, so you're not, with the round bottom, you're still touching the sole and the blade for, for both cuts, both the yeah. thick end. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, it's a tiny, minute adjustment that gives you this, uh, this flexibility. Yeah. With that said, there's also places in the seat in the, in the um, Windsor chair that's impossible to get with any other uh, spoke shape. In fact, the reason that uh, Greg told me um, that he likes my shaves is because you can get into those spots without the draw knife. Otherwise, the way he teaches you do those finished cuts with the draw knife, which is okay. pretty scary. Yeah. Draw knife, you can, you can go into a quarter inch shaving really easily. Um, yeah. Okay. 
All right, thanks. Absolutely. Good. And I think you're wrong. You what? I think you're wrong. About what? Economist to economist. Oh, um, yeah. Idea, idea. Um, Daryl, over to you. Oh, okay. Uh, Rusty, thank hey, you. Daryl. Uh, good, good presentation. Chairs. Um, I've made four Windsor chairs and a couple of benches and a bunch of stools and stuff. And the one thing I found for hollowing the seats was a big gouge on mm. a big handle because you can, you can put your body into it and lean on it and take out uh, shaving just like an ads would. Um, I found that's really good. So if, if anybody has a big gouge and doesn't have an ads, stick a big handle on it. It sounds um, like I'm going to be buying a big, big uh, gouge soon. Yeah, why not? Uh, this, yeah, this is uh, the one I use. Score, Just yeah. score. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've, the, the last chair I made was uh, made out of walnut. My, okay. my, wife, my wife scammed a walnut log from a, a tree cutting crew. She sweet talked them out of it. They cut, the, they cut it to size. They loaded it in her car and she brought it home and I made a chair for her. She's so, a keeper. Oh yeah, oh yeah. She gets me. She gets me uh, lots of wood, so to speak. Hey, hey. <laughs> <That's excellent. laughs> dear oh dear, dear oh dear. Let's let's get off that one, uh, Shrenik. Hey, Rusty. <laughs> Enjoy. Well, that thank you so much. I had so many questions. I had to come back. <laughs> um, so I had an interesting one, which was around the tools that you use. Now I'll you be the judge of that. I mean, most of the tools that you mentioned are fairly orthodox tools um, in, in chair making. Are there any un unorthodox tools that you use? So for example, maybe a blunt chisel or, um, you know, anything I like thought that. every chisel is a blood chisel. <laughs> Too soon. Uh, no, I don't, I mean, so, so here's probably the latest tool that I got and that is a spindle cutter. Uh, and that is just a blo block of uh, sycamore with a half inch tenon on this side. And part of it is reamed in the back uh, at a six degree taper again. And it has a little cutter. So it works like a, uh, a pencil sharpener. Um, this probably, and again, you don't have to have it. You can do all this work by a spoke shape. And that's what I used to do. Uh, none of the chairs that I built use that one. Uh, no, no, I, everything I use is pretty, pretty ordinary for chair making of it. Yeah, and, and what you were saying about the, the round bottom spoke shaves, I actually really enjoy using round bottom spoke shaves um, for, for some repair work I do generally. Want okay, I'm, I'm glad you added the repair work. Um, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure what, what you use it for. But yeah, I, I find, so, most of the time, so the problem was round bottom spoke shaves. You're talking about traditional ones. Yeah, boxwood ones. I've got some nice Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem with those is that uh, there, as far as I know, other than me, there is only one other person who does. Well, HNT Horton, I think, does one too. But yeah. they don't make the new ones. And the old ones that you find usually will have the mouth that's really, um, really big and, and kind of difficult to. Oops, there it is. See this? John Gap. Really interestingly, I actually was looking at the Quercus magazine website today, and on their shop, they actually sell the um, these types of spoke shapes, but they're made with rosewood. So there are others available. Is that so? Yeah, you should have a look. I should have a look indeed. Yeah, but but the thing about those is that they really easy to resolve. You can add a wear strip to it and close them out, and and um, Work as long as the iron is salvageable. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank the, you. The only one of the lines that uh, of mine that I have, it, it was an experiment out of uh, curly maple, and then I made a wear strip out of ebony, and then I realized ebony was way too soft, and so I added another wear strip from boxwood. So now I have boxwood inlaid into ebony, inlaid into wall into uh, maple, but it works pretty nice. Does look beautiful as well. Thank you. Lovely. I and was the, trying to do a, a knife finish, and then I gave up. <laughs> Lovely. The last question up is uh, Noel. 
Hey, Rusty. Uh, that was really interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, in the finishes, you, uh, is milk paint, is that your favourite, or have you any other finishes that you like or prefer? Um, so traditionally, the chairs are painted with milk paint. A um, couple of reasons. One is to protect it. It's really good protection. Um, usually, you use such thin layers that you can see the grain. In fact, um, I, I, I haven't prepared specific uh, slides for this, but when you scrape a seed, and when you, the milk paint is based, uh, water-based, so it's gonna raise the grain just enough that you can see the variation in the grain, even through the paint. And usually you'll have maybe um, at least two coats of the under, under color and then a couple of wash coats of the over color. So red over, uh, black over uh, red will have about four coats, but you can still see the grain. Sometimes you can you can see the oak, uh, feel the the ray flag in the in the oak through it as well. Um, so I'm a big fan of milk paint. I've used um, shellac uh, and oil as well. Uh, and now there's also going to be either oil or shellac over milk paint as well. And Curtis Buchanan will put wax on top of it as well. Um, I use, if it's not painted, I just use shellac. And I use this product called Royal Lac. And it's shellac with um, added resins. And it becomes impervious to alcohol and hot water after about 30 days. Uh, but you apply it as shellac. So you can do French polish with it. I do it for tables as well. Um, and I do just the usual blend of uh, boiled linseed oil, spar varnish, and uh, mineral spirits for the oil blend. Um, of all three, so it, you know, if it's a painted chair, milk paint is the only thing I've used. Uh, I know that people use other paints. I, I'm just not familiar, not as familiar with them. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thanks. Can I Absolutely. be checked? Can can I be cheeky and ask you what's your what's the book on your book bookshelf behind you? I see it. Um, you know, I haven't read that book. It's the good work um, that uh, Richard Arnold recommended to me that I should read it. I, I haven't gotten through it. I just finished last night the Village Carpenter, also recommended by Richard Arnold. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about reading a book about John Brown because I hear he was quite a character and and not in a particularly kind man. But but maybe one day I'll get into it. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah. Lovely. Well, uh, Rusty, that was absolutely um, amazing. You, you've kept us enthralled and um, you know with it for for over an hour now. So so thank you very much. Um, I'd like everybody to to raise their bench beverages in in the normal fashion. And uh, to toast to Rusty and the bench. Rusty Thank you, Rusty guys. The bench. Okay. Yes, Rusty. It's a high tech conversation and a low tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101.